Graft Survival, previously just an ocean explorer game, was reasonably well known up until December 3rd, 2019, where the introduction of the first chapter within the now infamous Raft storyline would see its popularity boom in just a few weeks. Thousands of people wanting to go through the journey themselves and discover what this sunken world has left to offer. I've taken time to go through all of the lore, some of the things you may not have seen, and I'll be breaking down chapter 1 of the Raft storyline, and I'll be telling you guys all of the relevant lore in chronological order. So, I'll start off with what makes the whole thing possible. The Notebook so, to navigate the storyline islands of Raft, you first need to access the notebook. And then as you pick up special storyline items, they'll appear on the left. And the notes and other lore items you collect will appear on the right. While the new locations you discover after completing the previous ones will be added in the markers in the middle. And each location is given a random four digit code, which is different for everybody. And to find out where the location is in your world, you'll have to enter this code that was given to you into your receiver. Upon looking at your receiver, it'll outline your selected location within a small box looking thing, so that you know where you're going. As we all know, the first location you're told to visit within the first chapter is the infamous radio tower, and upon getting there you'll board the tower and find your first note which will tell you about those who previously inhabited this rundown location. The diary entry talks about a team of four engineers who were sent to the radio tower to try and maintain a bunch of nuclear reactors which will apparently save the world. If you're wondering why they're given the task of saving the world? Well, sadly the world is flooding, and most of the world has completely flooded already. And later on in the story, we learn more about these floods and what humans are doing to fight back or survive. However, the same diary entry outlines the fact that things aren't actually going very well, and a number of the nuclear reactors are actually beginning to fail. One of the engineers also makes it pretty clear he's grateful to be in a dry place, as they state, quote, God knows they're in short supply, unquote, indicating that by this point, people were feeling pretty hopeless about the state of the world already. The four engineers were also given their own nicknames. Yes, you're exploring the place where Owl, Sparrow, Wren, and Cuckoo once lived. Each engineer was, as you can tell, given the name of a type of bird. The one writing all of these diary entries which we're stumbling across is Cuckoo, and he later writes that his co-worker Wren is apparently collaborating with their so-called shady employers, who Cuckoo doesn't like and thinks they're actually apparently up to something. As was said earlier, these engineers were given the task of trying to maintain these nuclear reactors, as they were part of only a few remaining efficient power sources in the world. However, while performing this quite clearly dangerous work, the engineers have failed to keep 100% safe. We're unsure exactly what this means, but it causes Ren to inform the employers of what's going on, and this then causes Ren to ditch two of his friends, leaving the radio tower and only taking Sparrow with him, as she is a skillful female engineer. Oh, and they also took the reactors, so Cuckoo and Al, the last two remaining engineers, tried catching up with them by setting out on a boat, but their chase didn't last very long as their boat's engine soon broke, leaving them stranded. They did, however, manage to swim back to the radio tower, but it is unknown what happened to them. Before signing off, Cuckoo outlines in one of his last notes that he thinks the engineers are, quote, headed to Selene. It's never been confirmed what this means, but it could quite possibly possibly be a location within chapter 3. We'll have to wait and find out. Anyways, after you've discovered all of the secrets of the radio tower, you're given a 4 digit code for the next island in the story, Vazakatan. Upon arrival, you'll see a large abandoned yacht with yet again a very dark backstory. The leader of the Vazakatan ship was Olof Vikström, who gathered his Swedish crew and set off onto the ocean. Olof abandoned his office in Stockholm, and it's unclear as to why, but my assumption would be the rising sea levels which at that point were quite clearly very deadly. Once out on sea, Olof had changed his ways quite quickly and refused to hand out too much food or drink for his crew, leaving most of it for himself and being quite selfish. He also left most of the vaccines for himself. However, it must be noted that Olof is not the captain of the ship. He is actually the owner. He is in charge of absolutely everything. And speaking of the captain, he doesn't have a great ending. Soon after setting out on the ocean, he accidentally cut himself on one of the chef's knives. We don't know how this happened, but it caused him to contract tetanus, and this in turn meant he slowly depleted in health 
and generally lost control of his crew. Eventually, his illness left him with a severely bad case of lockjaw, which meant he could barely open his mouth. And it wasn't long before he passed away, leaving the crew without a person to steer the ship. No one steps up to steer the ship, and so it just drifts throughout the ocean, leading the crew to become even more bewildered and uncivilized. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, huge rats started to be spotted on board, and this is where panic ensued. They tried using rat poison, but it never had any effect, and so drowning and shooting was then used, but it didn't work to very good effect either. They took down a few of the rats through brute force, but there were now holes in the boat, and Olaf had just simply had enough. He took a lifeboat and left the crew behind. Many followed him and did the same exact thing, and soon after the ship had bumped into an old mountaintop, which is where you find it in chapter one. It's unknown what happened to these crewmates, but I hope they're still out there and we might see them in the future. And so, after you've taken down the first radio tower and then the intimidating Vazigatan, you're given the hard task of exploring the last island within chapter one, and possibly the hardest one, Balboa Island. Balboa is a part of the evergreen biome, and it's heavily inhabited by an animal that you don't really want to run into without being properly prepared. Bears. Yes, Balboa, as you all know, is made up of three relay stations and one ranger station, all with their own secrets and notes left behind. However, the reason why people were inhabiting these towers is because they were once again sent there to maintain them. It's quite clear that people are choosing islands like Balboa, which haven't sunk. I think the reason they want Balboa to be maintained is because it's got a lot of resources and it's high up as well, so it's not at risk of flooding immediately. The two people sent to Balboa were Alberti and Bruno Coria, a couple and the first diary entry was written by Alberti, and it clearly talks about how she already feels pressured to depart the island and Bruno in order to find someone else at sea. Alberti also acted upon a distress signal they received without Bruno's acceptance or input, which she later apologised for, but this now means Alberti was out at sea and Bruno was all alone. Throughout the following weeks and months, it is pretty clear to us through the numerous diary entries that Bruno's mental state is rapidly deteriorating. His comments can often be described as insane and delusional. He also spoke about his children and actually created them using scraps on the island. He gives his children names and tried his best at giving them life by arguing with them and giving them character. With the sea level continuously rising though, Bruno eventually takes the decision to leave the island in his little boat, along with one of his fake children, Henry. Yes, Bruno had clearly decided to only bring one, and although it may be because of the size of the boat, further notes indicate that there is a deeper and darker reason. They outline the difficulty of deciding which child to bring along, however it is also said on a note that Bruno had already made up his mind on what child he was going to bring, and on the bottom of the note the word murder question mark was written, which may indicate that Bruno may have done something to his other child. It is unknown where Alberti or Bruno went, and whether Alberti's mission to respond to that signal was actually successful. Successful. And it's quite possible we may meet them in the future, but for now, we're just floating alone. That's all for chapter one, guys, but join me in the next video where we'll be covering chapter two of this very confusing story, where hopefully it will all start to make a bit more sense. Do you think these guys survived and maybe they all conjugated at Tangaroa? Well, that's a question for the comments. If you're new around here and enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe. It's completely free and you can always unsubscribe at any point. Leave a like if you want to see part two and I'll see you guys next time.